guys, never mind my disheveled and possibly changing hairstyle over the course of this video, I just started experimenting with a new look and haven't quite gotten the hang of it yet. In today's episode, we have a huge amount of loose ends to tie up on my 3D printer project before I can finally build the custom ramp steel I need to get everything running, like installing the limit switches, mounting a parts cooling fan, and taking care of this huge mess that is the current state of cable management on this machine. We're also going to learn the ancient technique of cable lacing, not because we need to, but because it's something I've been wanting to try for a while now. And we're also going down quite a few rabbit holes we need to visit in order to understand some of my more unconventional choices, like using no less than five separate power supplies to drive this machine. Now, the first thing I was going to do is to crop the PTFE tube to the furthest point it'll have to reach, which is down here, but I just realized if I cut it to the shortest length possible, like this, it'll sometimes get hung up on the corner of the z-axis here, and the only way to prevent this, other than mounting a ridiculous piece of wood to the machine, is by attaching the tube itself. And in that case, I can't crop it because it's exactly the right length already. It's a pretty big machine, to be honest. So instead, let's just attach it with a little mounting block. Same thing with the X carriage, except here I'm going the easy route of using one of those angled screw hooks, to which I can then zip tie the tube so it doesn't interfere too much with my cable management later. And as you can see, the zip tie I'm using is very short, because I'm indeed one of those people who reuse zip ties. Remember, reduce, reuse, recycle. To me, it's not even so much about saving money on zip ties. This is how we became the throwaway culture we are. Just because something's cheap enough that I can just buy a new one rather than bother to recover the old one, doesn't mean it makes sense to throw away something after its first use when it could also be used twice. By literally just paying attention to where you cut a zip tie you want to remove, you can reuse it multiple times on other things with a smaller circumference. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. You might have wondered how I move the Z carriage up and down without powering the machine every single time, since there is no convenient access to turn the lead screws, but I can pull the timing belt along here. Not exactly convenient, but it does the trick. Next, I need to mount the part cooling fan. It's one of those turbine-style radial fans. And to be honest, I didn't bother to think this all the way through and sketch it out in CAD. My plan was to stick it on there temporarily, just so it works, and then use the printer to print some kind of proper mount with air duct to go around the nozzle. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, I did briefly consider just tacking it on there with hot melt glue, but that would be downright cruel. So I ended up making this little bracket out of some scrap sheet metal to which I can stick the fan using double-sided tape, and then the bracket can be screwed to the carriage. Since I use a single screw, it's acting like a fulcrum, allowing me to adjust the fan so it just barely blows past the heater block. Honestly, it's really crude to just have the fan exhaust point in the general direction of the part. Having one fan on each side would be a lot better, but I hope this is gonna do for what I need. Lastly, I just need to slip the insulating silicone sleeve over the heater block. One thing that doesn't make sense with this cheap hot end kit is them putting long wires on the heating element and thermistor, but then using a fan with a short lead. I mean, to me it doesn't matter, since my machine is so big, I need to extend all those cables anyway, just for them to reach the electronics which will sit on the back of the spool holder that I also still have to make in this video. 20 minutes later. Also, it's totally ridiculous. I've collected so much wire over the years. This is only a small percentage of it. And yet, I still don't seem to have the right lengths and the right thicknesses at the right time. So if we don't really have the right stuff at hand, I may need to compromise on things like having colors match and maybe splice together a few shorter cables to get the right length. Okay, these are all extended and nicely labeled. It's insane how much wire that needs. For the heat brake fan and the x-axis motor, I'm going to use this former telecommunications cable which has six strands. Unfortunately, I at some point decided to cut it in half, so now one of those pieces alone is too short, which means I get to put it all back together again. 
But before I do that, I need to strip off the sheathing because it's too stiff and would impede motion of the carriage more than I like. With that taken care of, it's finally time to tackle limit switches, or end stops as they seem to be called in the 3D printing space these days. Since you can use pretty much any kind of momentary action switch as a limit switch, to varying degrees of functionality of course, I have a huge variety to choose from. However, I discovered if you can get your hands on a slightly older model of computer mouse to take apart, they usually have the exact same style of micro switch inside as ones used in end stops on 3D printers. Well, except for the little lever missing on the mouse button, I'm honestly not entirely sure what the purpose of this lever is. I assume it's to increase resolution, but in that case, it'll also scale up any irregularities in the trigger point. Either way, I'm pretty confident it'll work well enough without. And since I've apparently dissected quite a few of those mice in my lifetime, I now have a decent amount of micro switches to choose from. Now, I could just solder two wires to the switch and be done, but I noticed many of the end stop breakout boards you can buy have an LED on them that makes a futuristic flash when triggered during homing. And when there's an opportunity to add an LED of however questionable usefulness, guys, you know, I just have to take it. So I went ahead and put together three copies of the MakerBot version on some strip board. I literally used the same schematic and component values and they work exactly the same. Only on the x-axis one I used through-hole components because due to the way it'll be mounted to the carriage, all SMD components would be underneath. For the wire I'm going to use this old headphone cable. The thickness of the sheathing on this one is a little bit overkill, but it has three strands and it's exactly the length I need, so it's the most appropriate one I could find. Last but not least, I need to wire up the stepper motor, and you might have noticed I allocated only four wires to it. Now, for this to make any sense, we need to go down the rabbit hole of why I'm using four separate voltages to drive this machine instead of just two like everyone else. Unfortunately, the entire story with the stepper motors is such a huge can of worms to open, I simply cannot explain everything in this video, so buckle up, we're gonna keep it short and leave the details for some other time. At this point, I think we all know that I'm using unipolar stepper motors for this 3D printer, as opposed to the bipolar ones everyone else uses. The difference between unipolar and bipolar motors is primarily in the configuration of the windings. A bipolar motor simply has two windings and is driven by making current flow through those coils the right way round at the right time. That's what the super popular A4988 stepper motor driver does. On a unipolar motor, on the other hand, each winding has a center tap connected to power. So now the only thing you need to do is connect each of those four remaining wires to ground in the right sequence and bang you got a spinning motor with a much simpler drive circuitry because now you don't need to actively reverse the direction of current flow like you need to on the bipolar one. If you look at pretty much any unipolar stepper motor, you'll see it has six pins coming out of it, with the two in the middle representing the center taps connected to each other. Or in the case of my X and Y axis motor, they don't have the little satellite board soldered on, which means you can see how they are wound and center tapped. Therefore, by simply cutting the trace connecting the center taps and leaving them floating, you can get two individual coils which you can hook up to an A4988 and drive it like any old bipolar motor. That is literally what I was planning to do from day one. Now, I did end up making my own custom unipolar stepper motor drivers to go with it, but I'll be totally honest with you guys, I only did that so I would have a PCB to make for the sponsor. Apparently I did a good enough job hiding this that some people even thought I didn't know any better. 
but now that I have those special drivers, I obviously want to use them. Which nicely brings me to the power supply dilemma. There is another fundamental difference between unipolar and bipolar motors that actually has it make sense to use a dedicated unipolar driver for unipolar motors. You see, the windings on a bipolar motor have a very low resistance, and it's the motor driver that actually decides how much current gets to flow through them, whereas on a unipolar motor, the relatively high winding resistance limits current flow. So hooking a converted unipolar motor with a high coil resistance up to a bipolar driver designed for low winding resistances is just never going to work the way it's supposed to. What this means is that with a unipolar driver, the supply voltage suddenly matters. The more voltage, the more current, and eventually it'll burn out. So since my 28BYJ48 is designed for 5 volts as they are, I will need a separate 5 volt supply for it. And likewise, the Z-axis motor already gets really hot on 12 volts, so I don't dare run it any higher than that. Unfortunately, my 12 volt brick for the hot end isn't beefy enough to supply the additional 800 milliamps needed for the Z motor after all, so I just had to throw another separate 12 volt wall wart into the mix. I already explained in a previous video why I'm using all those separate small supplies instead of a big one. They are all e-waste, you can get them for free and much more readily than a huge 12 volt 360 watt unit. So coming to the conclusion, I'm going to use this 24 volt supply to drive my X and Y axis motors. Because for bipolar motors, yes even fake DIY ones, there is a rule saying the higher your winding resistance, the higher your drive voltage needs to be, otherwise it'll be the coil resistance limiting the current and not the driver. Another big, if not the biggest overall factor in all of this is winding impedance, which I intentionally ignored for the entirety of this explanation because it is outside the scope of this video. Anyway, end of my lecture, I enjoyed that way too much, even my voice is hoarse. Let's get back to wiring up those motors, shall we? And just when you thought this was all for naught, it is not. As you can see, I'm soldering my wires to the center tap and one of the outer connections, effectively using only half of the center tapped winding, or one phase. Because again, I want my resistance as low as possible to keep the ratio with the drive voltage intact. If I were to use both halves of the winding, even though people say it makes the motor have more torque, I end up doubling the resistance. In fact, when it comes to torque, these motors, as puny as they look, turn out to be totally sufficient. A stepper motor has a lot more torque when it's doing full steps, as opposed to when it's being micro-stepped. And these motors don't work with micro-stepping, so I don't have that problem. I don't need to oversize my stepper motors by something like 80% just to make sure I never miss a step. Right, with everything on the X carriage needing connected solder to a bunch of very long cables, it is about time I start neatly cable lacing everything to the Bowden tube. I ended up watching a couple of tutorials and it turns out it's a lot easier than I thought. Like, why didn't I try this earlier? Either way, I'm not exactly the right person to show you how it's done given I only just learned it myself, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, for a simple spot tie, which is basically the equivalent of a single zip tie, you take your string, create a loop like this, put it underneath your cable, put your fingers through it, and pull the long end of your string through to create another loop. Through that loop, you then pull the short end of the string as well, pull it tight, and put an overhand knot, which is basically the most generic knot everyone gets taught as a child, over it to secure it. Then you snip off your string and there is your spot tie. I'm using this one to tie together some of those fan cables before they join the main lacing. So for the actual lacing part, we start off with a clove hitch. I kind of knew that one already. It's a little difficult to do around things, but here we go. Take your string, put it around the cable, like so, over itself to create a loop. Then you go back underneath the cable the other way, and then you pull it through itself. 
So you basically get this kind of figure eight shape with your strings running off in both directions. This one is very suited for pulling things together tightly. You can finish it off with a simple overhand knot. Then the running stitches turn out to be nothing else than simple overhand knots. You put it behind, like so, over itself, and pull it through. And you see, it's a simple knot, except it's around the cables. You can position it wherever you want, and pull it tight. And that's what you do with the entire cable. Over itself, through, and there's your stitch. Underneath, over itself, and pulling through. Now for finishing it off, I'm not really sure there's an easy way to do it properly. Like everyone seems to gloss over it. I'm finishing it off with a simple overhand knot. Pull this one loose and do an overhand knot through it like so. There we go. Then I can pull it back tight. Yeah, it's not ideal, but it works. And there we have our laced cables. Now, I want to issue an apology in case there's any real aerospace engineers out there watching this and getting a heart attack over my barbarian execution of the fine art of cable lacing. I just want some laced cables, and these were the easiest methods I've found. Yes, I'm using cotton yarn to do this instead of wax lace, but at the end of the day, it's just a 3D printer, not a spaceship, and if my lacing ever were to come undone, at least no lives depend on it. And here we have the result! In the beginning, the spacing really could have been a bit more consistent, but toward the end, I kind of got into the rhythm, and I think it turned out great. Considering this was my first shot at cable lacing, I'm really happy with it. I mean, don't tell me this cable management isn't neat. Now, for the bit, it'll be the exact same process. However, since the Y carriage has been notoriously difficult to film in the past, I'll be doing that off camera in three, two, one. And would you believe it, it's already finished! Something that would have taken me three days to film was only an evening's work without all those YouTube shenanigans. Now, like I said, it's the exact same as on the X carriage. We have a limit switch here crashing into the frame when it reaches the end of travel like so. All the wires neatly bundled and coming out the side here. Now you'll notice I didn't lace it up all the way, but put on this spiral drag chain thingy instead, which incidentally I got out of the same typewriter that I also got those stepper motors from. I thought it would be neat to use as many parts of it as possible. The ends are attached with zip ties as strain relief, and as you can see I simply drilled a couple of holes into those cross members to be able to thread the cable ties through mainly because I was too lazy to make some custom brackets. And then I also added this little piece of scrap aluminum to make the cables come out neat and perpendicular. Mounting the Z-axis end stop is pretty much more of the same. First I soldered some headphone wires to it. This is actually the first time where I crack out the hot glue because those flimsy enameled wires need at least some strain relief to prevent them from ripping right off. Then I need to stick on a little spacer since the micro switch is protruding past the back of the circuit board otherwise. After winding the Z carriage all the way down, I can position the switch so it just barely clicked to mark the hole, drill it, and screw it in with the half strip screw making things even more difficult. Not gonna lie, this was really a pain in the butt to film, given it's just such an inconvenient spot on the machine, just like the print bid.
Finally, the Z motor is begging for some attention too. Since I have those fancy stepper motor drivers with flashy lights on them, I obviously want to show them off rather than hide them away in the electronics bay, so I had the idea of mounting it on those cross members such that it doesn't get in the way of moving the timing belt manually and all those LEDs are still mostly visible. Then, since I mentioned the Z motor getting quite toasty, I want to mount a cooling fan above it, because with the motor being round, I currently don't have any even remotely appropriate heatsink laying around that I could put on it. Unfortunately, even just mounting the fan is near impossible because the piece of HDF the motor sits on is only 3mm thick. Putting a bolt through it will have the nut on the other side get in the way of my timing belt, just screwing into it won't provide enough meat to grab onto, and I can't even make some kind of elaborate clamp thingy to go around the motor either because the dang connector PCB gets in the way. The only solution I was able to come up with that doesn't require me to take apart half the printer is really horrible. Driving some big wood screws into the fan as standoffs and heating them up to make hot melt glue stick better, I'm hot gluing the fan onto the HDF. I guess the only positive thing you can say about this is, it works. Now one noteworthy addition while extending wires on this fan is the 68 ohm resistor I'm putting in series to make the fan run on roughly half the power, because to be honest, this fan on full blast is completely overkill for cooling the stepper, it just makes a lot of unnecessary noise for little additional effect compared to less power, so it's best to cut down on it as much as possible. Yay! More lace cables! As you can maybe tell, I'm really enjoying this old-fashioned approach to cable management. So, things have come a very long way in this video. The last thing I need to do today is build some kind of filament spool holder to go here that I can mount the electronics to in the next episode. However, this video has gotten way out of hand again, and I'm on a schedule, so I have to do that in a montage. So please sit back and enjoy.
Well, that's a level of botch you're not used to seeing from my channel, huh? It doesn't fit in with the rest of the machine aesthetically, and it kind of looks like it was botched together out of random pieces of scrap in an evening. Because that's exactly what I did. Guys, that's the trade-off for getting more frequent uploads from me. The time has to come from somewhere. If I have only 13 days to shoot and edit a video, I can't always model something fancy in CAD beforehand. Unless someone tells me how to build a time machine, that is. Either way, we have space for the 24 volt power supply right underneath here. It's one of those that got inserted into the device rather than being part of the power cord like the other ones. Then there's a place for the Edmega on the back, and we even have ball bearings in the spool holder. It's more of those appallingly low quality bearings I used on the Z axis, and I mostly just put them in to get rid of them. Honestly, I hate the way it looks, but that doesn't matter as it'll do the job just fine. Also, I'll probably end up tearing it all apart again anyway, because when I do the lead screw upgrade, the extruder will go on the carriage in a direct drive configuration, because I heard that's better, in which case the filament roll has to go on top of the machine. Unless I go with a reverse bound setup, I guess. But whatever I end up doing, this will likely not be here to stay. I have a huge list of upgrades to do to this printer. It's like in the good old days where I built one table saw right after the other, because as soon as I finished the first one, I knew exactly what to do better on the next one. And to be honest, that's the real kick I get out of engineering. Anyway, that was it. Huge thanks goes to my supporters on Patreon. I hope you enjoyed, and I'm getting just as excited to see this thing actually print as you are. So stick around for the next episodes. See you then. Bye bye!